I got a, a book for Christmas by the philosopher Seneca. You, you know, you might even have the book. It's called How to Die. And it's, Seneca was <clears throat> essentially exiled in the latter part of his life and he wrote a bunch of letters. So there are, a lot of them have been retranslated. One of them is about how to die a good death. My granddaughter who had just turned six saw the book and said, she could read now, How to Die. She said, oh, you're dying? Grammy's going to be really sad. I said, well, I'm not dying right now. When? Well, I don't know. Well, how much longer? I don't know. I was speaking over in the chapel like a few a month or two ago, and right after the chapel, some, a guy comes up to me and goes, how much longer do you think you got left? <laughs> I mean, what? People just say the craziest things to me for some reason. Like I'm, I don't know. But the passage that we're going to read in a second is the, the weirdest passage in the whole Bible. So when they asked me to preach and said, you can preach on whatever you want, this is the one I went for. <laughs> I mean, if you can go to sleep with today's passage, you are really good. Because <laughs> this passage is about a witch and a ghost. Now, when was the last time you heard somebody read on Sunday morning a passage from the Bible about a witch and a ghost? You gotta listen to that. You gotta figure out what's going on there, a witch and a ghost. I thought God wasn't in favor of those things. Let's look at the passage together. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 28. And it's the story of Samuel going to see a witch or a medium or <clears throat> di uh, di different words are used to translate this. And in 1 Samuel 28, <clears throat> the Philistines are about ready to overthrow, overrun Israel, overthrow Saul as king. And he realizes that he's in very, very serious trouble. And as a result, he wants to ask God what he should do, but God has refused to speak to him. And so he goes and sees a witch. And that's where we take up the passage that you're going to see, I think, here on the screen. Here's verse 3 of 1 Samuel 28. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. And then Saul said to his servants, seek out for me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, behold, there's a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and he put on other garments and he went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, divine for me a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. And the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off all the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for, to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. <clears throat> and when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said to Saul, I see God coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, it's an old man. He's coming up and he's wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and he paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I'm in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you. Tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? 
the Lord has done to you as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn your king, torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. The last night of King Saul's life, he spends it with a witch trying to conjure a ghost. Let's pray. Lord, give us the lessons that we need from this passage today. And most of all, may your son Jesus Christ shine brightly through it. And we pray this in his name. Amen. This is a good lesson from a bad example. Saul is not a good example. He's not the way that we want to die. But he, we can learn how not to die from him. And so I want today to look at the end of Saul's life and see whether we can walk out of here and every one of us should strive with the help of Jesus Christ to avoid the errors of King Saul. Let's look at this passage together and see what the errors that King Saul actually made were. There, there are at least three of them. The first is that Saul failed to listen. He ignored God's silence. So if you want to end your life in the way that you should, first of all, listen to God's people around you. Notice that Saul had ignored God's prophet. Prophet Samuel had said to Saul, listen, you're going to go to the Amalekites. God is going to give the Amalekites the whole nation into your hand. When that happens, you need to kill all of them. You need to kill all of them, their cattle, their king, everything. You need to kill them all. And you remember what happened. Uh, Saul comes back after this battle and Samuel comes up to him and says, hey, Saul, did you kill all those animals you were supposed to? And Saul says, yeah, yeah, I killed every one of them. And then Samuel has this great line. He says, in the King James, he says, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ears? Samuel is saying, you're just a bold-faced liar, Saul. You know better. Saul knew better than this. He ignored what God had said to him, and he ignored the fact that God wasn't talking to him. Essentially, Samuel ghosted Saul, just refused to talk to him, right? That's, I guess, the new way of saying refuse to talk to people. My wife told me it ghosts. I don't know why it's ghosts, because like one of the main things ghosts do is talk to each other, so, or talk to people, so. But God had, uh, Samuel had ghosted Saul. There's there no talking, and that's what we get here. Saul is so upset, so upset about the fact that, that God won't speak to him, that he refuses to listen to God's silence. He ignored it. There were all different kinds of ways that, that one could speak to God. Uh, Saul hoped that God would speak to him through dreams, and God wasn't speaking to him through dreams. Saul hoped that God would speak to him through the Urim. You see that in about verse 6, the Urim. We don't know exactly what the Urim and Thummim were. They're mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the priest wore this, apparently wore this bag on his chest, and the bag had the ability to answer questions. Now, some say that the bag can answer questions because there's a white stone and a black stone in there. You asked a yes or no question, you reached your hand in, you pulled out one stone, and that answered the question for you. That's what a lot of people think. Others think that this is some kind of a miraculous event, and the bag actually answered people's questions. Whatever the case is, it's not speaking to Saul. I have in my office to a red, uh, I mean a white and a black stone. One of them says Urim and the other one says Thummim for when students come in to question me about grades. I just give them a chance. <laughs> Here's the bag, pull out one of those. 
And so it, if it's just two rocks, it may, it's hard to see how it wasn't speaking to Saul. But whatever the case is, Saul knows that God isn't speaking to him. He ignored God's silence. We must listen to those people that God has put into our lives like Samuel. The reason that Saul is going back to Samuel is that he realizes he should have listened to him in the first time, in the first place. So that's the first thing. If you're going to live the right kind of life, listen to godly people around you. Second thing that Saul didn't do, but we should do, is to love God's word. Saul abandoned the word of God. And, and this causes a variety of things. You see, the word of God in Deuteronomy had very clearly said, don't have anything to do with witches, don't have anything to do with mediums, don't have anything to do with the occult. Not because it doesn't work, but because you don't need to know that. Whatever you need to know, I'll tell you. And so when Saul goes to a witch, he's going to try to get information that God wouldn't give him. And so we, we run into this really interesting thing. First of all, abandoning God's word leads us to the wrong place. It's, it's difficult to tell for certain, but it seems like Saul may have been behind enemy lines, behind the lines of the Philistines in order to go to Endor where this woman was. And Endor has since become sort of famous, right? The, the bewitched mother-in-law is Endor, and there's the planet Endor. There's all these things where the Bible sort of creeps in culture around us. And what's going on here <clears throat> is that the scripture has said very clearly, don't do this. What was going on there? I mean, that's what we really want to know when we read a passage like this, isn't it? We want to know what's going on there. Is that really Samuel? Is this really a ghost story? Is that really a witch? What is that about? Three alternatives for you. One, this could really be Samuel brought up from the dead. The text calls him Samuel. Now, uh, often the text will call something what it looks like rather than what it really is. So that, that's not an absolute, but it could be Samuel because the text calls him Samuel. The second alternative is that it could be a demonic interpretation. That is, this is some kind of a satanic being that's acting like he's Samuel. And that's what's going on there. The third alternative, the one that you probably haven't heard of, is that this was fraud and the witch was a ventriloquist. Now, that, no, I'm, I'm serious, really. That's not a, in the early church, there's a lot of that going on. Ventriloquism was not something you did for entertainment in the early, early church. It was some kind of a spirit. Uh, for example, in the book of Acts, remember the girl that can tell fortunes, and then they cast a spirit out of her. She's called a ventriloquist. Obviously not a ventriloquist today, but it was, it was something else. Uh, Augustine, in talking about this passage, he says, Samuel was brought up by a ventriloquial spirit. And I don't know whether he means a real spirit or whether he means that sarcastically, a ventriloquial spirit. And so... What's going on here is this woman, she, the, the Hebrew says, she possesses an ob, an ob, an ob, obv maybe. It's Hebrew, so it's not exact, it doesn't exactly come through. An ob, it, there's a lot of controversy about exactly what it is, but it appears to be a hole in the ground. And so this, this woman would set up a tent over the hole in the ground, probably burn some pleasant smelling cannabis or something in the hole and it's at night and so you know you're getting a little elevated and it's dark and there's a witch and all of a sudden you hear this voice because Saul notice carefully Saul doesn't see Samuel the witch says oh I see an, an old man and he has a cloak and Samuel says, well, it's got to be Saul. It doesn't really narrow it down, an old man with a cloak, you know, from back, but he said, it's got to be Saul. And I think it's just all of this was so working on his mind that it was just, he, there was no getting out of it. And you can imagine what this must have been like, 
There's no electric light, just a fire. You're in a tent, smoky, probably ca cannabis or some other drug like that burning. And you hear, listen to this, so, or you'll miss it. You hear something like the witch calling up for Samuel, and then all of a sudden you hear, yeah, yeah, what do you want? What do you want down there? That would be scary. Think about it. It's dark. You don't know what's going on. And you hear, hey, Saul, get out of here. It's scary. And Saul all of a sudden says, this is real. This is the real guy. Samuel, what am I supposed to do? He's asking Samuel because God had not spoken to him. So Saul didn't listen to godly people. Saul didn't love God's word. And the third problem that Saul had in his life was that he didn't live his life for the end. There's a contrast here in 2 Samuel between David and Saul. 1 Samuel, I mean, between David and Saul. And neither of them are perfect, obviously. But David ends his life far differently than Saul does. Notice the way that Saul started out. He started out humble. He was this, the tallest man in all of Israel. He was a man really going, wanting to do what God wanted him to do. But then he ended very terribly. This is the last night of his life. And the, the image comes to him. The voice says, tomorrow you'll be with me. Now, some have said this must have been supernatural or it couldn't have, have predicted the death of Saul the next day. And I, I say two things to that. First of all, the text says, tomorrow you will be with me, not necessarily tomorrow you will die. But more importantly, and secondly, in chapter 31 of, of 1 Samuel, Saul dies, but he commits suicide. So it's highly possible that Saul was so upset by this voice, the message that he got from the voice, that he went out and committed suicide. Whatever it is, it's a terrible way for Saul to end his life. And in contrast, we see David ending his life in a great way, in a wonderful way. And we realize that we in Christianity, we who are members of the kingdom, with the help of our Lord, can either live our lives to end well or not to end well. One of the problems that I've had in the last couple of years is with the number of ministers, both local and worldwide, who have fallen into horrible sin. It seems like you read about it every day in the newspaper and you want to say, what is going on here? What is wrong with the church when people look at it and say, I don't want to be a part of that? I was, I'm a magician. I was at a convention with my son, a magician's convention a few weeks ago, and I have a whole bunch of DVDs, magic, don't have a DVD player anymore. So I saw this kid and I said, hey, I've got a whole bunch of DVDs. I didn't know the kid. I said, I've got a whole bunch of DVDs just right down your address and I'll send them to you. And my son said, you're a lunatic. Do you know what that kid's going to go back and tell his father? I, I, you know, we were in the crowd and all of that. And, you, you know, and, and, and but it, 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 it's just this idea that I said to my son, I'll go meet his parents and I'll tell him I'm a minister. And my son said, don't tell him that, it'll make it worse. And what kind of a place do we live in when that makes it worse? That's a disgrace to the church of God. It's a disgrace to the church of God when ministers are engaged in illicit sexual conduct and somebody doesn't stand up and says, that's wrong, he can't do that. It's a disgrace. It's not the end of anybody's salvation. Certainly David engaged in illicit behavior, but he didn't end his life that way. Saul ended his life that way. There's a very famous preacher called Henry Ward Beecher. His sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Henry Ward Beecher was undoubtedly the most famous minister 
in the United States at the time, maybe the most famous person in the United States at the time. People used to come from thousands of miles to hear him preach. And so he was going to give the lectures on preaching at Yale University. And right before he's going to give the lectures on preaching, he starts to shave and he cuts himself. And as he watches that little bit of blood run down his cheek, he thinks about how his life is falling apart. He's being sued by one of his church's deacons for having an affair with that man's wife. The newspaper is saying that Henry Ward Beecher ministers to four or five women very closely each Sunday night. His life is falling apart, his marriage is falling apart, and he fell apart. What had once been the most famous man in America ended up his life in total degradation. That's the end of his story. That's the end of Saul's story. But it doesn't have to be the end of your story because Saul shouldn't have been the king. David is a better king than Saul. And yet, in the New Testament, we see David's name mentioned again, right? There's one coming who is the son of David, who's better a king than David. As good a king as David was for the people of Israel, this is the best king. The king who has come and offered us forgiveness by the shedding of his blood. That's the king whom we serve. That's the king that we want to end well for. That's the king that really is what we need. We live in a world that is frightened by so many things. We live in a world that is put off by so many things. And yet what we ought to realize is that the truth of the matter is, what we need is not a new president, not a new Congress. What we need is our people who will turn to the king who is the son of David. That's really the answer to our problems. And until we listen to that, nothing is gonna be okay. That's just the way it is. Until we listen to that, we're all going to have a danger of ending up our lives like King Saul. Don't do that. Don't end up your life like that. I've had several friends of mine in the ministry whose ministry has been ruined right at the end because of foolish decisions that they've made because of secrets that they kept and dishonesty that they were engaged in. Let's not be like that. Let's be people of the Lord, people of Jesus Christ, people of the son of David, who may not be perfect, but we're trying to end well. A couple of months ago, I did a, a, a special talk on Charles Spurgeon, famous minister from London, England. Spurgeon died relatively young, <clears throat> and at his funeral, someone said, the great thing about Spurgeon was that he was the same in the pulpit or out of the pulpit. He was just the same guy. There was no pretense. He was who he was. I hope somebody can say that about me when I die. That'll be a good day. Well, I mean, I'll be dead, but, uh, you know, it's still a good day. <laughs> that we give up the pretenses, stop doing what we know God doesn't want us to do, and ask for help, the help that can only come through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can walk out of here and try, 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 and you'll fail. But you can walk out of here and trust, and you will not have to end up your life like Saul. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this time that we have had together. Thank you for this passage of Scripture and what it means to us. And I pray that you will bless it to each of our hearts and that you will remind us to live our lives so that we can end in a way that you will be proud. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen.